It's Monday night. Okay, we'll call the regular meeting to order. Uh, November 9th, 2020. It says 6 p.m. on the agenda, but uh, what are we, 826. We had our public hearing, obviously upstairs. Well, I was upstairs. I think we were all scattered across the uh, ranch house here tonight. So uh, before we get going, uh, I just wanted to say that we're, um, obviously we enacted our mandatory mask bylaw today. Cochrane's cases are 14. Um, just to be clear that we are all not wearing masks because we have our barriers in place and we are following the AHS guidelines and the COVID, well, protocols so that we don't have to wear a mask while we're seating or seated. I'm, I always fumble with that one in chambers. So, but just um, before we get started, I just wanted to say that um, obviously we're seeing an increase of cases across the province and across the country. And Cochrane has been doing so awesome over the past few months and keeping our cases below that dreaded 10 number. Um, it's kind of inevitable with the rate that we were at. So uh, here we are. We have our mask bylaw in place. And I just wanted to remind people that it is only one of the three protocols that we should be mindful of, and that is um, washing hands, physical distancing, and now wearing a mask. So um, obviously it's a change. We've seen a lot of, or I have anyways, a lot of feedback on social media already about loving masks, hating masks. It's pretty tight race, 50-50 down the stretch, but um, I just would like to send my thoughts, and I'm sure all of Council's thoughts, to those 14 Cochrane residents that are currently struggling with COVID-19 in however manner that is, and wish them a speedy recovery. Um, so I think whether you're for or against a mask, that I would like us to remain calm and thinking about those individuals that are actually affected and those families uh, with COVID. So with that, Keep calm and put your mask on. I think that's my my motto for, for tonight. So with that, uh, could I get a motion to adopt the agenda unless there's anything to add or delete? Councillor Reed, you're quick on the light tonight. Yep. Uh, I would move that we adopt the agenda as proposed. Okay, all those in favor? That carries, thank you. And uh, obviously council had an op opportunity to look at the minutes of our last meeting. Anyone like to make a motion to adopt? Councilor Badeco. I'll make a motion to adopt the minutes from our last meeting. All right, all those in favor? That carries as well. So delegations. Ms. Good Lowe. evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the Cochrane and Area Humane Society presents annually to Council to provide insight into their activities in the community for the year, including programs and services, as well as provide a year in review. And now tonight, with, along with that, will be the impacts of COVID-19 and what that has had on their shelter operations. Um, Janine Rossler, the Executive Director, and Carla Bennett, Operations Manager, here to present on their behalf. Good evening, thank you for waiting. Appreciate you being here tonight. Good Smiling evening. under here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. So as mentioned, I'm Janine Rossler, the executive director of the Carcanary Community Society and with me is Carla Bennett, operations manager. And I just wanted to start uh, with saying I hope everyone has stayed safe and healthy. Uh, and for those that have found themselves directly affected by the current crisis or the virus, I express my thoughts and best wishes to you and your family and your loved ones. So today, while we are keeping the presentation on, on 2020 updates and our current status in the pandemic, I will just briefly mention that 2019 was another busy and successful year for the organization. We cared for the most animals in our history and did so through the dedication and generosity of our community and our supporters. So 2020 rolled in with some change, a big change. Tracy Keith stepped away from the executive director role mid-January after 22 years of service. 
But lucky for us, she did stay on and is staying on as the department head of behavior, following her passion of animal behavior. And we're so grateful for that. 2020 continued to roll with changes, uh, not only for us, but the whole world. And COVID-19 was a down step pandemic and we've been learning and pivoting and adjusting and innovating ever since. On March 17th, we closed our doors to the general public, recognizing our part to mitigate the risk of transmission of COVID-19 and needing to do what we can to be part of the solution in the local and national movement to plank the curve. New operating plans were quickly put into place Health and safety of our volunteers, staff, and members of the public, and of course the animals in our care was prioritized through various measures, following the directives of the provincial health authorities, minimizing viral exposure through enhanced disinfection processes, limiting our visits to the shelter, services spaced by appointment, working from home rotations for staff where possible. We had 160 animals in care when we closed our doors and an incredible foster home community stepped forward to take the majority of our animals into their homes so we could decrease the number on site, decreasing the staff and volunteers needed to be on site and allowing us to focus on the immediate needs of animals. Our doors always remained open to animals in need, however. Not knowing if our industry would be recognized as an essential service, the Cochrane Area Humane System Cochranary Humane Society, along with five other Alberta-based humane societies and animal shelters, wrote a joint letter to Premier Kinney and all of the MLAs outlining our integral part in delivering essential services to our pet-owning and animal-loving province. Our industry was thankfully deemed an essential service in April, and we were extremely relieved to hear this news as our commitment to animals and in emergency situations remained a priority. The Cochranary Humane Society's could focus right away on social services for both pets and for people in need in our community. For example, we have pet safekeeping and emergency board boarding programs for those in personal crisis situations. We partner with the Cochrane Activettes to provide food um, for community pets, a need we saw uh, increase dramatically. And calls, were calls for action were put forth to replenish our pet food bank, as well as for items from our wish list to support the shelter animals and the operation. As you can imagine, our fast disappearing supply of cleaning products was a concern, as I'm sure it was everywhere else. At the shelter, we did our best to adapt to what seemed like changes by the hour in such a fluid situation. Our hospital team continued to provide all the necessary medical care to stray, injured, and other incoming animals, and the animal care team ensured quality of life through daily kennel enrichments for our residents and utilizing our rehabilitation and education center for exercising our dogs during physical distancing times. Our puppies were placed into specialized socializing programs prior to making them available for adoption to set them up for success as much as possible as we knew their interactions with other people and other dogs so critical in their development would be limited during social distancing times. Intakes and adoptions were and still are being conducted by appointment for safety and to minimize the number of visitors on site and this approach is working very well. The need to continue supporting dogs and their people was met through virtual training classes and behavior consults. Adapting our classes to focus on COVID-19 related challenges was important. And so classes such as raising your puppy during COVID-19 and keeping your dog busy while socially distancing were created. We also knew that people would be struggling not only with their dogs, but financially as well. So the classes were initially offered as a pay what you can to ensure we were supporting all who needed help during this challenging time. Over the months, we've continued to work hard to support our animals and our people. This crisis has certainly come with its challenges, however. The events surrounding the pandemic necessitated the postponement of all of our major fundraising events, as well as the majority of our programs and services for a number of months. These are some of our most important revenue streams as 95% of our income is generated through self-help initiatives. As only 5% of our income comes through grant opportunities, we were especially appreciative of being awarded with an operating grant through the town of Cochrane, which allows us to maintain critical programs for our community members and our pets. A heartfelt thank you to you all. We are actively exploring various third party and online fundraisers in the absence of our traditional events to support the inter operation in the interim. A main goal early on was to avoid staff layoffs and we have managed to do so through government support and wage subsidy programs. So where do we go from here and what's going to be our new normal? 
Well, while we don't entirely know that yet, uh, the new normal keeps changing right now, and that presents challenges in itself. What we do know is that we will continue to serve the people and animals in our community and be beyond this a pandemic. This year, we've had about 1,700 animals um, come through in our doors, through our doors, and have adopted 1,300 of those animals so far. In alignment with provincial relaunch strategies, we too have been responding, moving forward with some of our programs and services as it was safe to do so. When we we did begin hosting dog training classes on site again with smaller class sizes and making the necessary changes to allow for COVID-19 recommendations. Pace, our um, education program has resumed workshops combining both virtual and on-site sessions. We're offering a new reactive dog private workshop series. We move forward to have Norm's Nook, which is our on-site pet supply store. Um, those products available online and for curbside pickup. Our grooming services have remained open as we've been able to space the appointment appropriately and our dog wash is also operational with restrictions in place and, and different cleaning protocols. A highlight this fall was the grand opening of our memorial garden made possible through the Tanner Cochran's community grant. We're very proud of this incredible space that provides a serene spot to reflect and share memories and honor the animals that have touched our hearts. We are very happy to provide this beautiful space for our community and we welcome everyone to enjoy it. At this time, our doors remain closed to casual visits and we'll be assessing opening up the shelter to the general public when it is safe to do so. We were hoping that was gonna be sooner rather than later, but we'll wait a little bit longer to do so. We're actively re-examining our strategic plan and will adjust to better align with the current environment. Our funding efforts will be changing in format. Virtual and online technology have been embraced. Things will look different and, things will, and different things will need to be tried. Personally, I have learned that we are much more adaptable and resilient than we thought and that we can work through fear and uncertainty. And as a team, we have great strengths and committed staff and volunteers and board of directors, positive thinking and the ability to lift each other up and never compromising our standards, being innovative in the face of reduced revenues. We are grateful to the many supporters who have stood beside us and continue to stand beside us to keep our doors open. While this pandemic has changed so much so quickly, it does not mean that things will or need to go back to how they were before. We have an opportunity to rethink things, to try and evaluate and adjust. And then I think we'll find our new normal. And along the way, we stay tremendously grateful to have the town of Cochrane supporting the work that the Cochrane Area Humane Society does every day. One thing that hasn't changed, that's our mission. Leading and educating communities in animal welfare by providing pets in need with shelter, rehabilitation, training and opportunity, and supporting those people, supporting all people in responsible pet ownership, saving and changing lives. I thank you for the opportunity to share this 2020 update with you. I encourage you to bid on some fantastic items that will be available in our first and upcoming online auction fundraiser starting November 20th and I do wish all of you continued health and wellness. Thank you very much. Well thank you for your presentation. Um, I really appreciated your approach. I didn't hear anything negative in there and there are so many things that we could all be hanging our heads for yeah. and about and um, I just commend you on the way that you're ad adapting and overcoming the challenges of our reality. So um, I think it's, it's easy for us as a community to continue to look in the mirror at how this pandemic is affecting us as people. Mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciate the lens that you brought tonight about how it's affecting pets and animals as well. So thank you for all you're doing for our community in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Flowers. I do want to say thank you for your presentation and just comment on how much our pets helped us through the COVID mm -hmm. times and uh, so many people I know have adopted animals and they're just really enjoying them and the pets are helping us through. Thanks for all the work that you do. Thank you. Councillor Pedeco. 
Thank you for all the work that you guys do. I too adopted during COVID, so it's, uh, it's always good. I don't need any more animals though right now, so my kids would love that though. Um, I did want to put on uh, the floor option one, obviously that council will accept the presentation uh, by the Cochrane and Humane Society's information. Um, but also I did have one quick question for you. Uh, did some of your numbers go down um, because of Airdrie perhaps taking some of that load off of you? I'm not sure, or are you still dealing with the Airdrie community as well on, on top of Cochrane? Mm -hmm. um, so Airdrie is still within our service area in terms of providing support. Certainly anyone can surrender to us. Um, for strays, they do have a more on-site support in that regard. So we do anticipate those numbers will um, decline over time. We are seeing the odd um, stray still come in, but numbers have declined and we do think that will, will continue. But Airdrie as an area lacking animal welfare support in that sense. Uh, we will still support however we can for people and the animals there that need us. Perfect, thank you. And I just wanted to say that um, thank you for looking at perhaps taking an opportunity to do things differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a big statement because no one knows what it's going to look like. So thanks for at least exploring that and, and keeping those options open and not staying on the same old path. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll continue to see the glass half full. Okay, I don't see any other questions from council. Uh, nope. Call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you once again. Thanks for waiting for us to get to you tonight. No, not a problem. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you to you all. Have a good evening. Mr. Weldon, are you here to... Introduce the next delegation. I am, yes. <laughs> Just give me one second, please. Okay, good evening, Mayor Janung, members of council. I'm here to introduce uh, Ms. Jerry Maitland, who's the Executive Director of the Cochrane Public Library. Um, Ms. Maitland is here to present an update on uh, the library's activities and to present their budget uh, and 2021 funding requests to council. So, uh, welcome. Mayor and Council, it's so nice to see you in person. Mm -hmm. And blessings to you and your family. I know this has been a really difficult time for everybody and God bless you for what you do as I've sat for the last two hours waiting for this presentation. I'm sure that you're in information overload. So I will try and make this um, an engaging and interesting presentation. As I was driving here tonight, I was thinking about not coming to council in the spring this year with the knights and the trumpets and uh, doing the fun thing that we do every year. And we have sorely missed that. Um, I don't know when that will happen again, but uh, certainly staff uh, send their greetings and wish that they could be a part of the shenanigans tonight. So they do think about you often. And I do bring greetings from our board. Uh, they're not here physically tonight, but I know they're here in spirit, if not online watching. So I just want to bring you some updates and give you a little bit of background what I've been up to uh, in the last year. I'm not going to go into all the details about um, our population and how our building's too small. We all know that. I have been preaching that for five and a half years now. So we all know, we all know that our building's fantastic. People love it. They love coming to the library and things have not really changed too much. So I'm just going to give you some uh, stats that I have been um, touting around the province. I have been invited a number of times to come and talk about our library and all the wonderful things that we do. And so it's really quite amazing that we have in our community of 30,000 people, over 18,000 people have library cards and we are really proud of that. We have, a, we have tripled that number in the last five years. So people are using our services. They know that they're important. 
Our Rocky View constituents, we have over 3,000 people right now currently have library memberships. Um, Pre-COVID, we had between 425 and 500 people a day coming through the doors of that building. And people are excited about what we do and what we offer them. Our daily visits, we have, I'll talk about our COVID update in a little bit, but they're about half right now since we've opened our doors. Yearly, our program attendance, including those big events like Medieval Day, we, we usually have typically more than 13,000 people attending our, all of our programs, including International Women's Day and all the big events and things that we do. And it's just really important to keep stressing that we serve everybody and all our programs and our services are free with their library card and their membership. So we did a survey about a year ago, uh, just asking people what they liked or didn't like or what we could do better. And the, th the things that we heard the most were that patrons really, really love our library, but it's too small. Um, people are looking for a quiet space. They want more programming. They want more books. They want more computers. They want more of everything. And they want a safe place, specifically for teens in the community and they always want more hours. So part of the presentations that I've been doing to other libraries and specifically to Rocky View this last year have been about how we add value. So we all know, we do all the traditional things that libraries do. We have books, we have DVDs, we have games, we have digital resources. A lot of times people don't even know that you can read 450 newspapers online with your library membership. We will do research for people if they need help. We offer a safe space. We're always focused on literacies of all kinds, but specifically children's literacies. And on top of all the things that every other library does, we also have increased our library of things. That's what we've started calling it now. Four years ago, we started um, partnering with Canadian Tire and Lending Power Tools. That lending library is still really well used. We've had funding for gardening tools, we have games, we have puzzles, we have life jackets. Um, that was the Life Saving Society came to us and asked if we would be a test for them to um, lend out life jackets. So we do that and we brought them out again this summer and they're extremely popular and we're happy that we are part of saving lives in our community. If you haven't had the opportunity to go on our website lately, I would encourage you to do so. The librarians over the summer have taken it um, upon themselves to start doing little videos and they are hilarious. Um, one of the things that we decided during COVID was to make some more traditional picnic games available. We had funding for that. Um, we, there's a video where it's in black and white with some 1920s flapper kind of music promoting those ginormous adult size hopper balls, there's tug of war, there's egg and spoon, there's all kinds of those old traditional games in croquet, so we've been promoting that. Those games have just started coming back into the library as the weather's gotten colder, so very popular. And most recently, we put together a really high-tech ghost hunting kit that um, the public has really <laughs> taken to. And we've been, if you follow Twitter or our Instagram or Facebook feeds, people have been putting stories about the ghosts that they've been tracking down in the community. So you might want to look into that. Last year, we launched in partnership with Sports Check, our snowshoe lending library. We had more funding from Kabbalah's and Breck this year. So we're adding more snowshoes. We have avalanche safety kits with shovels and um, trackers, tracking devices, and poles and cleats. So it hadn't even really started to snow yet, and people were asking us when we were bringing the snowshoes back this year. So hugely popular. And these are all things that are supporting all those other literacies besides reading. So outdoor health is really important in a literacy. We support science and STEAM. So STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We had, we have spent about $30,000 gathering equipment for our makerspace, and of course during COVID, nobody had access to that. So to help all of those parents that are struggling and the homeschooler kids and their parents, we have made our microscopes available. We have very expensive telescopes that have been re-kitted. Um, we are, we've been lending those out for a long time. And then we have six Lego Mindstorm sets that we have 
put together and we're lending all of that out. So all the technology that we have, that's not even counting the cricket cutters and the um, other sewing machines and things like that that we have in our maker space. We're cataloging those and getting those out to the public so they can use those and they are highly, highly in demand. We also had funding last year and have a 3D printer in our maker space. That is not walking out the door, but people can go online and we help them create whatever it is that they want and we will print it for them free of charge. So we've had lots of money to support that and get people what they need and teaching them online. And we have been doing a lot of online programming, still doing um, tech programs. We've been going out to the seniors' homes. We've been helping in every way possible and getting our technology out there. So over the last five months, we have brought, we've applied for and received $20,000 in grant funding. Um, that includes money for a book club in a bag so we can get people reading from home and doing Zoom meetings, the traditional picnic games that I mentioned, literacy backpacks that are themed so people can pick those up and there's uh, all kinds of assorted things in there that are by genre to help people and I'm trying to think of what Andrea did recently that like a science backpack with um, all kinds of activities that are included in those kits. Um, more outdoor experiences, we're going to add camping equipment, not sleeping bags, but tents and things like that. Um, we did story walks this year, so they were destroyed a few times, but we have continued to do this. So they are just storyboards that when you're on the path that you can read the stories with your children as you go. And then we're looking for more technology grant programming and funding. So it's one of the things that we do exceptionally well is looking for money and actually getting it. One of the things that we put some of our resources in was increasing our e-resources and we did this with some of our own personal funds. This particular uh, service, BrainFuse, is a, er, an online homework help service so you can connect right away with a tutor and there's also a job searching help part of that that's all online. So we pay for that out of our own funding. It's about $4,000 a year and we've already got people using it. We've just launched it. You'll see more information in the newspapers and on our online sources coming up here and it will, should be on our website as of today. So really important. And the other thing that we've done really well that I mentioned in the past was our engaging our community in these big events. We sorely miss doing this. We will continue as soon as it's safe. Um, we did a really great Indigenous event, um, an author event in February. Uh, Richard Van Camp was, was here, Aaron Paquette. Those are the kind of events that we want to continue to bring to this community where people may not have a chance to go into Calgary. And, and see those people, we're actually bringing them here. Those events cost us a lot of money and we get huge amounts of funding for those as well. So we're really proud of those events. Um, Fred Panner has stayed in touch with us. We did receive $17,000 in funding a few years ago from the Toronto Public Library Foundation and had the Children's Literature Festival, Canadian Children Literature Festival here and Fred Panner had such a great time and we enjoyed him so much that day. And he stays in touch, we get emails from him and he wants to come back. So hopefully we'll be able to do that again. And if you look down at the middle of that slide, that was October 29th, two years ago. I don't know how we get away with the great weather that we do, but um, we had over a thousand people that day sitting listening to Fred and dancing with him. So again, we miss that. So. There's, there's, some, oh, there's good news here too. I know that we've all been struggling with this pandemic, but we were able to respond quickly. And we did close the library on March 15th in conjunction with uh, the town and took their advice and we were, we were prepared. We did have a small version of a pandemic response policy. We have since expanded that. Uh, we did keep staff on payroll for a good six weeks before we realized that we needed to take a look at that. Just like everybody else, we just wanted people to stay calm, stay safe as we navigated our way through that. So for the first time in history of public libraries um, across the province and the country, we were laying staff off. 
and we have a unionized staff, so we had to work closely with our union, and we successfully navigated our way through that, and we also navigated successfully bringing everybody back on board, and we started to do that in May. Public libraries were really a focus of the government during the pandemic, and we spent a lot of time online talking to Dr. Henshaw. Um, Alberta Health and Safety was with us every step of the way. Calgary Public Library, I have to say, has been a godsend. Their human resource department has always reached out to us to help in any way, and um, they helped us write a lot of our policies and work closely with the union. So um, I'm really grateful for that relationship. And so we got, we brought staff back at the end of May and started doing curbside service. Um, and it was, it was slow for the first few days and it happened, um, it, it picked up speed. People started to realize that they could access their library um, needs. Uh, we gave out 700 memberships. We, put, we got online right away. Everybody was able to either renew their library card or apply for a new card. And we did that within the first three months of the library being closed. And we were happy to do that. We waived library fees. We did not charge for library memberships. And uh, we were helping all of those parents that all of a sudden found themselves at home trying to get their children through a day and get them through school. So we were available um, as professional staff. Uh, the un there were a few union staff that stepped up to help us through that, but mostly there were four of us running the library online and uh, we managed, like everybody else has, to figure that all out. So as soon as they called phase two, we were ready um, to do that. We were prepared to open our doors on June 29th, so it was a Monday. We had a trickle of people coming into the library. We decided and determined that because of the space of the library, we could allow 10 people in at a time. And uh, the first couple days, it was kind of slow. July 1st hit, we were closed. That Thursday, we had 350 people come through the library. And prior to that, we had opened our book shoots, and it was just ridiculous, the amount of materials that we got back. Now, the interesting thing, and people don't realize, is that we have to quarantine all the materials as they come back into the library. So staff were suited up. Um, in lab coats, masks, shields, gloves. They pull all the materials out of the chute, we put them on a book cart, and it goes to rest in the boardroom for three days, and then we check them in and get them back on the shelves and back out. So that has been our life since we reopened the 1st of July. We have opened with limited hours. So we were 63 hours a week, we're down to 50. We close at six o'clock and we're closed on Sundays. That extra time is dedicated to cleaning the library, sanitizing it, and doing all the extra things that we need to do, and then just uh, giving all the materials in the library a rest on Sunday. We're still offering curbside service. Not a lot of people are really using it, but we've kept it there available, and if we do go into lockdown again, we know that we can safely continue on with those services. And again, we did increase a lot, of, we put thousands of dollars into increasing our online services so that people had um, increased access. And um, we continue to meet all of the AHS safety requirements and we stay in close contact with, with them. And we've had a few incidents where people don't want to sanitize their hands when they come in. I'm really grateful that we've actually mandated masks as of today that will make our lives a little bit easier not happy that that happened because of 14 cases but it really is a helpful situation for us in keeping people safe we do not know anything about phase three libraries kind of um, navigate in their own little world and everybody's being very quiet about that we're just planning on carrying on as we are right now and we will be prepared to open when everybody else is and when we get the word so just to give you a little side-by-side -side example, I talked about the hours that were open. We were pre-COVID open seven days a week, now we're open six, 63 hours versus 50. Um, average people through the door. Right now we're still seeing about 250 people a day coming through the doors of the library, which is really fascinating because we only allow, we've increased it to 15 people. The professional staff are working at home as much as possible, so there's few, fewer bodies in the library. Um, and they're only allowed to stay in the library for 30 minutes. So 
people are coming in doing what they need to do and getting out. They come in through the parking lot side door, they take a number and they exit out through the garden and everybody has been really um, helpful and for the most part abiding by the rules that we put in place and we are happy to serve as we can and keeping everybody safe and staff safe. The other interesting thing that's happened, even though we have fewer people, I would say almost half a day coming into the library, the amount of material that we're circulating has doubled. So we've gone from you know, 900 to 1,000 items a day being processed to 1,800, which is astounding. Um, and considering that a lot of those materials are having a nap in the boardroom for a few days, it's, it's interesting. I think the thing that's, that is really driving those numbers are our library of things. People are using all of those extra things that we're offering to them and they come and go really rapidly. And we're happy about that. Our staffing establishment is still at 13 FTE. It hasn't moved from last year, but we're managing, we're doing okay. The other good news on top of all of that is the Alberta government has been really uh, pushing the message back out to all of the libraries in Alberta that we were going to get all of our funding this year and we have received our final payment from them. It's significant, it's $145,000 a year. Um, the other thing to note about that is that they have guaranteed our funding next year for 2021, but it's based on 2016 population numbers. So it is good news that they're continuing to fund us, but we're out about $40,000 a year in our little library just because of the rapid population increase. So we don't know when that is going to change. For now, we're just grateful that they haven't cut that funding. So having said all of that, um, we really are at capacity. We are still underfunded, we are understaffed, we are undersized. We will continue to reach for a bigger space. Um, we, we, know, we know the problems that everybody is facing right now and the restrictions and we, and we don't expect that we are going to be able to get a new building anytime soon, but we are always looking for new and innovative ways to get the message out that we're there for our community. We wanna to continue to do that. So I'm just doing my due diligence here by expressing that like I always do. That message has not changed we still need a bigger space, and we know that that will happen. Uh, before COVID, we had been actively pursuing the idea of a satellite branch at, um, at Spray Lakes Rec Center. That is not off the table, but I think what's important for you to understand is that we cannot do that and sustain it without another full-time body, and we know that that will happen in time. Um, it will cost us about $200,000 in capital funds just to get a small, um, site launched and I have to tell you the other piece that happened in, in the process of talking about that satellite branch and what it would look like here in Cochrane we had spent a year and a half Marigold uh, and, my, and myself talking about putting a satellite branch in at Brad Creek and on February 24th Rocky View Council approved hundred thousand dollars for us to do just that so that money has been approved everything has been ordered and by the end of December 1st of January we will have that little satellite branch up and running in Brad Creek. So that's really good news. Rocky View was really keen on that. That was part of the, my continuous um, running around the, the, the municipality spreading the good news about libraries. So they really love the model and they love what we do here in Cochrane. So kudos to Rocky View for hearing that message and getting that out there. That will be um, a big deal for them. And so this was just the satellite space, I've talked a lot about this before, really is based on that model that is at the Rocky View Rec Center. Um, again, really interesting conversations happening in library land because rec centers and public libraries were really the way that everybody was going and COVID has really changed that conversation, specifically when those rec centers have been closed and nobody could access those spaces. So I don't know what that looks like going forward. It's just a conversation that we are all um, mulling around libraries as uh, public spaces where people come to sit and relax and spend the day. We really don't know what that's going to look like going forward. So we are happy to continue this conversation with the satellite space and it's not off the books. We will continue to find 
new ways and new models of what that looks like to get our library outside of our current space so that everybody has access to it. And um, having said that, that's really all I wanted to share with you this evening. I'm, we're so grateful for your library support. Um, we are happy to do what we can here in the community and we're proud of the work that we've done, so thank you. Well, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for sharing all of the updates. <laughs> and again, it's, um, it's just been an extreme challenge for all of us, but it, it looks like you guys are adapting and, and doing what you can with COVID and uh, just thank you for providing the service and it looks like people are really utilizing with uh, 1800 um, while you're doubling in your handling so yeah. well I did I did what I didn't mention is that people have always been begging for more parking so thank you everybody loves the new parking lot that the library has there's only one way in and one way out so they assume that that's the library parking lot I'm just I was going to say you on your up. list of wishes we've, we've checked one and that's we checked parking. that off yeah. so we're very grateful for that I don't know how we're going to run medieval day events over on that tarmac but uh, you know we're creative we will figure that out but we do appreciate that lovely new space. I have to tell you though, speaking of people who want to get to the library, the seniors from that center that is just a kitty corner adjacent to the library, during the whole summer when we were under construction on all areas, so we were surrounded. I don't know how people actually found their way to the library, but God bless those seniors. They were in their walkers, hobbling across there with their walkers in the gravel to get to the library. So nothing will stop a library patron from getting to the library, not even gravel and no signage. And it was, it was a fun experience all over the summer, but we're glad that that's over and happy that the roads are clear and we're, we're there. <laughs> awesome. Councillor Flowers. Thank you for your presentation, Jerry. You've done a great job of navigating through COVID, you and your staff, and I know how hard you've worked and how serious you take it all. Um, I've enjoyed my last three years sitting on the board, and I'm sorry to be leaving, but <laughs> Councillor Nagel will be happy to take over and um, come to your meetings. And You told him we're really easy to get along with, right, <laughs> Susan? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'll enjoy the learning curve. I've always been amazed at what you guys do in that small space and um, all the different variety of programs and how you meet the needs of the community time and time again. So thank you for all your work and congratulations on the Bragg Creek extension. I know thank that you. was in the making for a while. Um, I think that's it. Oh, I was curious about the ghost hunting kit. Is there any stories coming out of that? Uh, they, if you go online, I've only seen a few. We've just been encouraging. We put a, a diary actually into the kit so that people could actually write little notes. Mm -hmm. But I know that they've been down at the museum. So there is, there's a night seeking camera. There's a video recorder and there's something that reads electric waves and things like that. So. I don't know all the technical details behind that kit, but people are having a really fun time with it. So we know there are ghosts in Cochrane. Yes. Confirmed. <laughs> well, thank you. It's very creative. And I'll put forward the recommended action that Council accepts the presentation by the Cochrane Public Library as information. Thank you, Councillor Flowers. Councillor Fideko. Geez, I was just going to do that, but you beat me to it. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Jerry, to you and your staff. You guys do an amazing job in finding grants, uh, grant opportunities, making the money happen, and uh, bringing a whole bunch of col you know, strangely collective things to the library. But um, it's great. The things that you are able to offer are impressive all the way around for families of all ages. And uh, I know that I've been there, and I've watched people take out power tools to life jackets to... You name it, it, it goes out the door. So just kudos to your staff for doing such a great job. Thank you. Councillor McFadden. Yeah, really I just wanted to echo the comments and uh, compliment you and your staff and the board on uh, the innovation. And clearly you're always remembering, you know, that it's about, it's about your clients, about the people that are coming through your door. And so just compliments to you for being such great public servants and for making things happen. And and thank you for the reminder of why the library is so amazing. I clearly have to come in there and get some snowshoes. <laughs> and I'm clearly going to have to come get a ghost hunting kit because that's a thing going on in my family right now. So anyhow, thank you for your innovation. And I clearly have thank to spend you. more time in the library. Thank you. You have to put a hold on the ghost hunting kit, but yeah. it's first come, first serve for the snowshoes. All right, fair enough. There you go. 
And Susan, thank you for your service. We really appreciate, we've really enjoyed having you on the board, so thank you. And we'll try to be good to, to uh, Councillor Nagel. <laughs> Councillor Reed? Yeah, Jerry, just <clears throat> to echo what everybody else has said, it's great. I, I think the one thing that, um, that you probably didn't highlight that, that I think is really worth recognizing is your website. Like, you guys have an incredible website. I don't know who, who does that for you, but, um, but having just gone on it just again, just as a, I had a little break there. Um, <laughs> Can I just comment on that really amazing. quickly? Because a part of that is Marigold's fault. Um, they, we, all of our, they have 37 libraries in that library system, and you know, we are so grateful that we are a, a part of that. And their IT department restructured that. So we had to do a lot of the back end work, but they did all the work to get that interface up and running, and then we've been able to go in and do whatever we need. So it's, it's kind of a two-fold thing. So it's Marigold, their IT department, the money that the town pays for us to belong is well worth the money. And then I have really creative, really tech savvy staff that can carry on with the day to day stuff to manage that. So thank you for noticing that. I appreciate that. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I will call the question. All those in favor, accepting his information, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Stay safe, luck. everybody. You thank too. You. Thank okay. you. Cruising into bylaws. Ms. Van Kaimpima. Take your time, sanitize. <laughs> Thank you for turning off the microphone. <laughs> I think I did, I forgot to do that at the bridge opening ceremony about 12 times. Good evening, Mayor Janung, members of council. There we go. I'm before you this evening to present the borrowing bylaw for first reading for the Highway 1A improvements borrowing. So at your last meeting on October the 26th, you decided to go ahead with the Highway 1A improvement projects, a $12.9 million project. And at that time, we had explained to you the funding of that project was going to be a combination of the Municipal Stimulus Program grant at $3.4 million, uh, as well as off-site levies and tax-supported debt. That was also reflected in the budget book. Just before I put this report together to go into your package, I contacted our engineers to confirm the proportion of the off-site levies. Uh, the understanding was that this was an arterial project where the split is 80-20. Turns out that this is an intersection project and intersection projects, the cost share between offsite levies and the town is 54-46. So you may or may not have noticed that the amount originally uh, was $1.8 million for the town. And then if you look at tonight's proposed borrowing, it's 2.4 million. That's the difference between going from 80-20 to 5446. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, it was very last minute on Thursday and I did a mad scramble to make sure the report was correct and I'm just glad that I was able to catch that uh, before we started down the road of the borrowing bylaw. So whenever we have a borrowing bylaw, we have to advertise it for two weeks and in accordance with our advertising bylaw, we will be posting it in the paper for two weeks, so November 12th and 19th. Then there's a 15 day petition period and then it comes back to council for second and third readings and that would be at your December 14th meeting. 30 days after third reading, we would have a valid borrowing bylaw and after that time we could borrow. However, the plan is to uh, not draw that money until the project is almost or totally complete. The reason being, is that of the $12.9 million, only 19% is coming from tax supported debt. Uh, and it's at 2.4 million, we do have those other sources of funding that can fund the cost of the construction as we're going along. What that does is it allows us to only borrow once we know what the total amount is that we will need. Because as you know, projects don't tend to come in right to the penny. Um, and so that way we wouldn't borrow more than we actually need to cover off the remaining actual costs. 
The other thing that that does allow us to do, construction will start in 2021, we'll cash flow it through 21 and 22 through the other sources, which means we probably will not be drawing this debt until mid to late 2022, which means repayment wouldn't start until 2023. So that means that the impact on taxpayers would not show up until 2023. So what would that impact be? Because we're not borrowing, we're not taking the money until we actually need it. So we're anticipating 2022. Uh, who knows what the interest rates will do between now and then. So I don't ask you to set a specific interest rate that's today's rate because today's rate will not be tomorrow's rate. Uh, so what we've done is I'm recommending a maximum 3%. It's anticipated interest rates won't be volatile in the next couple of years. Uh, so I feel confident that we could set a maximum of 3%. I'm also recommending that we borrow for a term of 15 years. If we do that, the repayment costs per year would be $205,000 to repay that debt in full over 15 years. That's probably about two-thirds or 0.6% tax increase based on the 2020 taxes collected. And once we do this borrowing, considering all of the other uh, debt that we already have on our books, plus there's an outstanding borrowing bylaw for the last little bit of the bridge that we haven't drawn on, uh, which is the nine million, which we will be drawing on the next opportunity. All that in, we would be at 29% of our debt limit. And our debt limit is just over $93 million. So that concludes my presentation. I would welcome any questions that you would have. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And just a point of clarification on process. So tonight is first reading. We can ask questions, but then you noted in your presentation, we will be posting for 14 days. Then there's a period of waiting for 30 days, or we, is that after the second reading? So the process is first reading this evening. We advertise in two newspapers, November 12th, 19th. Starting on the 19th, there's a 15-day petition 15. process. That ends December the 4th, end of day. Then we come back for second and third reading on December the 14th. Should council give it third reading on the 14th, 30 days from that date or January 13th, we would have a valid borrowing bylaw and we could borrow at that time, although that's not the plan. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Councillor Reed. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I'll move, actually, just to get it on the table, I'll move option one to Councillor, uh, give first reading to bylaw 22 uh, the 1A improvement borrowing. So just to segue back to the discussion about uh, the 1.5 to 2.4. So, so t t tell me what happened again there. The, <laughs> the percentage of the borrowing has to be split 54. No. no. Okay. So the, the project cost is $12.9 million. So then the first thing we deduct is the Municipal Stimulus Program Grant, the 3.4. Then that net amount is split 54% off-site levy and 46% to town other ways of, uh, sorry, no, let me back up. $12.9 million, 54% goes to off-site levies. That's $6,966,000. So 54% of 12.9. Then the remaining amount is the town's responsibility. So the town's responsible amount, we deduct 3.4 for the grant, leaving us $2.4 million of debt to fund the remaining portion of the town's part of the project. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Fideko. Uh, thank you. I only have one quick question. Um, obviously, you said that it goes into a kind of a petition period. I'm assuming that's not a, a public hearing of such, but will we get um, the feedback obviously collected from the public or from whoever during that petition period brought forward to us at that next council meeting when we go to look at second reading? So, Councillor Fidego, it's not necessarily the same as a public hearing. It's an opportunity for the public to put together a petition where they can then petition council to have to put it to a vote of the populace before you could go ahead with the borrowing bylaw. 
So it's a little bit different. There wouldn't necessarily be comments that we would be bringing back, but if we were to receive a petition, then we would, the, actually it goes to the chief administrative officer who would then have to present that petition and whether or not that petition is valid. Perfect, thanks for the clarification. Okay, council, any other questions? First reading, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of first reading? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Business. Mr. Stewart's going to join us for a presentation on civil land development. Okay, uh, good evening, Mayor and members of council, members of senior leadership team. Tonight, I'm here to uh, give a bit of a presentation on what the Civil Land Development Department does for the, the town of Cochrane. So just a quick little bit of background. Uh, the team consists of four people, myself, David Robinson, Ashley Broom, and Talis Hume. David's been with us for just about seven years. He comes from a land development consultant background. Ashley's been with us for just about the same amount of time. She came from a construction background. And Talis Hume has been with us for just about four years, and he spent two years as a summer student in our W3 operations department. So just a quick uh, preview of what I'm going to be discussing today. I'm going to be touching on the role of civil land development as it relates to the entire development permit process, and then also some of the other touch points we have in regards to capital projects and other roles within the town. Um, so, as you guys know, kind of the hierarchy of the planning world is um, from a municipal standpoint would be the area structure plan or area redevelopment plan. So through these plans, uh, the planning department essentially is focused on comparing the, the submission to the municipal development plan or the Cochrane sorry, sustainability plan, the Cochrane strategic plan, the parks and open space master plan, and the land use bylaw. The Civil Land Development Department is more focused on the technical aspect of things, so the water, the sanitary, covered under the W3 Master Plan, or the Transportation Master Plan, which is known as Connecting Cochrane, or Integrated Stormwater Master Plan. So we review the submissions and applications against those uh, long-term overarching documents for the entire municipal boundary. So a little more detail on what we look at for the water and wastewater plan. Here's just a screenshot of the River Heights area structure plan. You can see it encompasses quite a great spread of land. But through the W3, when you're looking at it for water, wastewater, you're evaluating it on um, the, the needs for water servicing. So you're identifying pressure zones, sizes of reservoirs to service the area, whether you need uh, booster stations to get the water and residential pressure and fire flows to higher areas or whether you need lift, sanitary lift stations to collect sanitary and affluent from lower areas of the land and get back up to our gravity system, which ultimately makes its way to Calgary. Um, we also, in terms of the road network, we're, we're making sure that it's aligned with our connecting Cochrane uh, transportation master plan in terms of highway access locations, multimodal um, means of transportation, so pedestrian facilities, obviously, cycling facilities. And um, in regards to stormwater, again, just in line with the integrated stormwater master plan. So we're looking for ultimate pond locations, setting release rates for the entire development so that what we discharge to the Bow River isn't causing a negative impact on that. And then environmental and slope considerations. So as we all know, we live in a 
fairly uh, topographically challenging area to develop in certain locations, and so we review the plans, make sure that we're protecting these areas, not just for s slope stability, but also for you know um, environmental considerations. So after the process for an area structure plan or an area redevelopment plan has gone through that process and council has um, accepted the plan via st statutory bylaw. We move on to neighborhood plan, which breaks down those areas into a much more detailed area. We start looking at the actual road network and from a local road perspective, we identify ponds and uh, municipal reserves, also known for, so parks areas or schools areas. And through this area, we, we get into much more detail as to the development of the land. So at the high level, it's just kind of the storm pond is shown in a location. You, you look at the release rates a little bit for how the land's going to function, and then you move forward into the much more detailed. So at the neighborhood plan level, you've actually kind of sized out what the pond is. You've looked at general overland escape routes. If, we were to have a very major rain and the trap flows or the streets are inundated with water. It all stays away from private property and flows down the curbs and into ponds. Uh, again, you're just, for with water and sanitary, you're looking at um, details of pipe sizes, making sure there's redundancy in the system so the system's looped so that if a main breaks, you can isolate it and um, not affect the entire community, but rather a very small number of people. I, believe the number is 55 for um, shutdowns in, in terms of valve placement. Um, again, for transportation, you're re we're reviewing the transportation impact assessments. So those help us understand what types of intersection controls are needed at certain locations. They help us understand what timing of offsite improvements, whether it's signals being added to a, uh, an existing intersection or an existing intersection needs the acceleration lane or deceleration lane provided to it. From there, once council's approved a neighborhood plan, um, generally a developer will go straight into a stripping and grading application so that they can start prepping the land to provide, excuse me, um, provide the servicing required to actually bring the lands online and be able to bring them to the market. So. This is the stage where we're really concerned with, uh, or not really concerned, sorry, but where we're evaluating the boundary conditions, making sure there's no impacts to adjacent lands. We're identifying areas of deep fills so that we know where um, the land needs to sit and consolidate for longer periods of time before development can actually occur on them. We evaluate the impacts to surface drainage through this process, and a fairly large focus is on erosion and sediment control for this stage because the land has now been stripped. So from stripping and grading application, it goes to the subdivision stage. And this is where the majority of the community sees the construction happening because it kind of happens on their doorstep, so to say. So through this process, we are reviewing, uh, improving the drawings, we're inspecting the infrastructure that gets installed, we're signing off on the utility and service constructions through our CCC and FAC process. And our major role is to ensure that the construction drawings and the installations follow the guidelines and specifications in front of us. We create the servicing agreements to enter into with the developments to both um, be able to hold them accountable and also for them to know what's expected of them and outlines what's expected of us through that process. Um, again, at this stage, it's just another TIA. Is essential. It's mostly just an update letter at this stage to confirm that the overarching TIAs from the neighborhood plan is still um, addressing things and its, its information is timely and consistent with what was assumed earlier. Stormwater gets into a lot more um, surface grades, actual ponding elevations on roadways to ensure that, you know, the, um, the neighborhood or the private property within the neighborhoods are not going to get damaged, but there is an escape route and adequate storm system in place for draining the water away after those large events. And then also through this process, we may have to work through um, oversizing downstream areas or actually bringing that water booster station online as part of a phase to keep servicing those areas. And then, <clears throat> sorry, also um, off-site off road upgrades such as 
providing emergency access if the community is built out over a certain number of units or another public access. Uh, in this case, for Fireside out to Towers Trail, once we hit a certain number of units within the community. And then we also uh, work on development permits with the plan department. Um, plan does a great job of evaluating it based on the land use bylaw, uh, other Western Heritage design guidelines, aspects like that. And then once the plan is essentially in a position where the plan department is going to be able to support the application, we, we uh, take it over from that in terms of grading and site servicing to ensure that the site is actually going to work, that there's proper uh, fire protection, and it's not impacting adjacent properties. We, through this process, we also identify any public works that need to happen to service those properties, and we'll go through a process with the developer to ensure that the work on our side of the property is built to our specs and guidelines, and the infrastructure that's built on the private side of the property line it follows the guidelines that are in place. However, we don't inspect infrastructure on private land. We, um, that's essentially their, their responsibility to give themselves a proper product. We ensure that the grading and stuff doesn't impact adjacent lands, but we don't go to the depth of inspection that we do on, private pro on public property, sorry, that will be transferred to the, to the town. Kind of last stage of the development process um, is the shallow utility installation. Uh, in new neighborhoods, this is rather quite simple process because there, we've already been aware of where all the utilities are gonna go through that stage. But in existing areas when a third party, such as Shaw, Bell, Atco, Fortis needs to do an upgrade or repair, um, they work with us to ensure there's no conflicts with existing infrastructure. My, my group works with the provider to ensure that the the community is aware of the construction that's taking place. The notification has been provided appropriately. If they need to close any roads, then they'll work through a road closure process with us and then do some pre and post construction inspections to ensure that the infrastructure that they're um, working within is returned to the way it was. And then again, there will be another inspection two years afterwards to make sure that there's no deficiencies or settlements in the work that they provided. Uh, we also have a role in some of the capital projects that River Heights Reservoir expansion is the one that I'm currently working on right now with the developer, I should say jointly working on with the developer group on that. We're ensuring that it's sized appropriately for the future expansion of that area and the serviceability of the lands that it will be able to provide to. Um, Mr. Sylvester is working with me on that as well, just ensuring that the demands that we're assuming for the future are appropriate but not overly conservative as we all know water is very important to us here and we want to be able to stretch our resources as far as we can. Um, James Walker Trail is essentially wrapped up but we again I just listed a couple of capital projects. My group does work more much more so on the design side of things as opposed to the actual construction and field management of it. But yeah the headlands pile wall, the slope rehab project from a few years ago a little groundwater spring diversion project that most people probably don't even know happened. And um, yeah, the redevelopment stormwater plan. So there is a council capital project last year to evaluate our kind of downtown and redevelopment areas to put us in a good position for when redevelopment happens in, in these areas and we have a plan moving forward for those. We also uh, work with the public when their inquiries come in, so just general uh, questions about construction in their neighborhood. Um, quite a few times we'll get inquiries about the grading on their property and whether their builder uh, graded it the way it was meant to be. So we, we spend quite a bit of our spring and summer, not quite a bit, but quite a few site visits throughout the spring and summer answering questions for the public for that. We also answer questions about the storm system and how it functions, whether it be swales or trap in front of their house. We're monitoring erosion and sediment control throughout the communities quite diligently, but at the same time, the public is able to reach out and talk to us about those things. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, traffic impacts from uh, upgrades in the existing areas, and so closures of roads and how those detours impact the communities. We do what we can to kind of balance the um, impact of the community, but also not make it too difficult for um, development to do their work quickly. 
And then some just other touch points that we have um, when there's a technical development permit coming to planning commission, we will attend. Um, same goes for subdivision appeal hearings. We sit on with the Cochrane Developer Liaison Group to kind of discuss uh, more of the consultant and construction side of uh, concerns both from the town and from the development community to us. We work with records on uh, point requests or provide support sometimes when the documents it's just a little unclear whether it's part of the request or not or also where it should be f filed permanently. Um, we've been playing a fairly major role in the land use bylaw rewrite and the amendments that are coming right now just understand that that document is 16 years old, almost 17 years old, and uh, we've learned a lot uh, working through the, that document and what we can do better within it. Again, um, we're looking at through this next three-year budget cycle to look at the Connecting Cochrane, provide an update to that, knowing what we know now with the closures to, um, or the proposed closure to Range Road 43, as well as some of the other changes to the Highway Transportation Network. Uh, I already mentioned the capital projects that we've been working on. We do work with assessment a little bit to help them do their projections for year end so that our, our growth assumptions can be as accurate as possible. And then I'll, I'm also myself involved a little bit with the offsite levy bylaw rewrite just in terms of identifying projects and helping, proje helping project when they're uh, need by the community. And with that, I uh, thank you for your time and I'm available for any questions. Well, thank you for that. That was a lot. It's uh, no wonder you guys are so busy down there. And I, I have one question for you, and that is, uh, and you didn't touch on it, but I've been saying this to almost every department, but how has COVID affected your work life? The departments? Yeah. Um, working from home for the, for, for the very startup of uh, the, fr the, the spring melt was a, was a challenge. Um, there's lots of concerns coming in and felt a little unable to assist as we normally do. So that was a challenge. We also uh, lost a staff member before the start of COVID and one was on mat leave as well. So David and Talis did a great job to do what they could while I was helping with planning as well. So was, we're, we're, we're back to good numbers now. We're feeling good. Good. So I've um, been saying this to every department, but please pass along to all the people that you listed on, the, on your presentation our thanks for all the work you're doing and for all the efforts that you're, you're making through the challenges of COVID and all the curves that it's been throwing all of us, but uh, carrying on with your work nonetheless. So thank I'll you. I'll pass that along and yeah. appreciate it. Uh, Councillor Flowers. Thanks for your presentation. Um, did I hear you say that when a community gets to a certain number, then they get a second access to a certain population? Yes, that's correct. So when it's under 100 units, you're allowed to operate off of one public access. When you're over 100 units, it's one public and one emergency. And when you're over 600 units, it's two public accesses. And 100 units is 100 homes or? Uh, yeah, 100 dwelling units, yeah. So either townhomes or single families multifamily site. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of acronyms too. <laughs> what does TIA, TIA stand for? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's a traffic impact assessment. Oh. So, yeah. An SWMR? A stormwater management oh. report. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My last question. You can go on all night. <laughs> Keep flipping them. CPC. The Planning Commission. <laughs> yeah. My last question was about public input. So is the Cochrane Planning Commission the main source of your input into your work from the public? Um, honestly, the main source of public input into our work happens at the neighborhood plan or land use uh, redesignation mm -hmm. stage. Once council is kind of granted the land use redesignation to the lands, then uh, we essentially kind of just run with that land use as it's at the market's uh, driven pace. Okay, thank you. I'll make the recommended action to um, accept the 20, or no, what is it? I'm on the wrong page. Yep, 2020 Recommend. Civil and Development. Yeah. That one. Presentation is information? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Councillor McFadden? Yeah, I did have uh, one question. Um, just for clarity, I think I've lost track of all of our capital projects. The Fourth Avenue Groundwater Spring Diversion Project, 
I don't actually know what that one is. Yeah, that was, um, it wasn't actually a, a budgeted capital project. It was one of uh, Rhodes' operational little projects. So the, if you go down 4th Avenue, almost towards the creek, kind of where the bend to go up to Sunterra is, there's a little gravel road that heads down that way. There was a spring coming out of the side of the road that was causing um, operations, more ice maintenance and maintaining than was needed. So uh, Talis actually just helped with a little design and got the spring diverted away from the road so we didn't have to maintain. Much like the road into the ranch house, similar design we borrowed from that, so. Excellent, yeah, sorry, that was a, I wasn't familiar with that one, so yeah. thanks for the clarification. But uh, yeah, just to echo what's been said, uh, really appreciate all the work that your team does. Um, your team is another one of those teams that we never, as long as you guys are doing exceptional work, we never hear about you. So keep doing that, I guess. But, um, <laughs> but also, thank you so much. Um, I know through, through COVID and the reorg, uh, a, lot of, a lot of extra work and a lot of extra time being put on uh, fewer, fewer people. And so thank you for delivering on that and the level of professionalism you've continued to demonstrate and deliver to Cochrane. So thank you for your work and to your team. Thanks for your kind work. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for everything you're doing and for your presentation tonight. Thanks. We will sanitize and move on. all wipes. Good evening. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. Maybe just move this a tad bit. Uh, my name is Tanya Golan. I'm the financial services manager and I'm here to provide a report on financial services. A little bit about who we are and what we do for the town of Cochrane. Uh, Super high level, what we do is we provide, of course, financial services to the town. Uh, we bill out for the services that we provide, for example, for utilities. We also take uh, manage the invoicing on behalf of uh, all the activities that happen operationally uh, or otherwise, capital. We provide reporting expertise uh, to various levels throughout the town for example, to management as they go about their day-to-day -day activities. We also um, provide financial software and technology to support the financial operations and reporting for the town. Lastly, but not least, we are always have a keen eye on the future. We're always looking to make sure that we are ahead of any tools that are at our disposal to make sure that we're providing the best value services for the town. Quick glance, um, as you know, we're in the thick of budget right now. That's how our year starts out and sets the stage. Then throughout the year, we report back to council on uh, how we are performing each quarter. We go monthly, perform our billings, and uh, every two weeks, we're making payments to vendors. We wrap up the year by preparing our annual financial report and audited financial statements. At the start of 2020, this was the financial services team. 
You will notice that on the right hand side of the screen there was a position for the asset management coordinator in 2020. However, um, throughout 2020, um, as I've mentioned before, I think we planned for 2020 and then 2020 happened. Uh, we did put on hold some of the hires for the year and due to the budgetary constraints that the town is facing, we're not planning to put forward this position for 2021. In terms of revenues that are collected by the town, of course, the biggest piece of the pie is tax. However, the next biggest piece is the user fees, uh, which is primarily consists of uh, utilities. On the financial services team, we have a few team members that help us do this work. And uh, my team uh, participated in providing photos that I could show today so you could see who the members of the team were. They're probably at home cheering right now that um, unfortunately I won't be able to bring these up, it looks like. My apologies for that. However, we have two uh, team members that uh, perform the utilities billings. We have Jody and Christina. They're very busy monthly. Uh, we have approximately 12 and a half thousand utility account holders and we're adding 30 net new utility accounts every month on average. Uh, that equates to about $1.3 million we're collecting monthly. Um, we are working towards getting uh, more automated. We have currently 66% of those account holders that are receive their bills through e-billing and approximately a quarter of those are making their payments through pre-authorized payment. The next team member I'd like to highlight is our accounts receivable team. Currently um, it is Linda who is uh, manning the accounts receivable and billings for the town. So by billings I mean we bill for taxes, we bill for utilities, and then we bill for all the other services we provide. Uh, we bill for off-site levies, that's approximately six million dollars annually. Um, we have as you saw earlier in the presentation from the Humane Society, currently the town holds six and a half thousand uh, annual licenses which are billed out monthly. Starting in 2021, we're going to be billing out all animal license holders on January 1st. This is going to be a huge efficiency for the financial services team and free up more time to do the other work around all the other billings for the services that we do. Uh, accounts receivable also takes care of the net new to 2020 transit fare. Uh, so we do offer monthly passes and books of tickets for riders on a Colt. Uh, we sell these fares at various locations throughout the town, so uh, part of our role is to distribute these uh, passes and tickets throughout the town and collect the fares. The next team members I'd like to highlight are the customer service representatives. These are the team members that you see when you come into the ranch house. They're uh, sort of the uh, first people to greet visitors and they also answer the main town line and answer general in inquiries. I'm very appreciative of them. They're a wealth of knowledge and expertise when it comes to the town, and they work really hard to provide a high level of customer service. These, uh, our customer service representatives also take care of all the payments that happen throughout the town. Of course, we don't just collect payments online. We collect them at the ranch house, uh, at FCSS, and all the other facilities. This is intended to demonstrate maybe more so than read. Um, here's what that looks like in terms of payments throughout the town. Uh, of course, we have various methods of payment, which the next level happen at all these different uh, facilities throughout the town. Um, and at each facility, we have several different systems that do the business of collecting payments. And then each system may have multiple different uh, a sort of uh, revenue streams that it's collecting payments for. So for example, we have uh, Event Pro at the Ranch House that collects for the Ranch House for Event Center and for facility rentals. So our customer service representatives are very busy. 
The next team member I'd like to highlight is April, who uh, leads the accounts payable charge for the town. Um, when we think about accounts payable, sometimes it's easier to think about the volume of transactions that happen annually. Um, we do have a high number in the thousands of transactions that happen uh, for a lower dollar value. Um, we have a program for purchasing cards. There's currently 170 purchasing cards uh, made available, which really brings a lot of efficiencies to us. Um, the vendor for our purchasing cards has an online tool, which uh, we rolled out in early 2020. It's now online in terms of submitting your purchases and getting uh, the appropriate approvals. As we move along the spectrum here, um, we increase in terms of dollar value, so it increases in terms of the net effort required for these payments. So uh, we have internal policies and guidelines that we do follow. Um, perhaps as we get into the medium uh, dollar transactions, uh, there's a requirement to uh, go out and get three competitive bids. Um, and certainly once we're in the higher dollar transactions, I'm thinking of our major capital projects, they need to be competitively, competitively bid on uh, through APC, which is the Alberta Purchasing Connection. I will try not to use too many acronyms. <laughs> um, this is just a, a graphical version of the transactions that happen throughout the town. As I just mentioned, purchasing cards are by far and wide the highest in terms of volumes, number of transactions. The line denotes the average dollar per transaction, so you'll see that primarily the larger dollar transactions are happening via EFT. The data's in, so now what? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Financial Services has a keen eye on the future. We're working very hard to develop in-house expertise in terms of finance. Uh, we are always looking towards the tools at our disposal to reimagine how we offer and deliver these financial services. Um, we have a focus on our financial systems, which is a big part of what we do, but also on our processes. We're continually reviewing them and um, trying to make sure that they address the, today's current uh, municipal environment. We also look to innovate as much as possible through technology. Who? Uh, so we have a senior financial officer, Robin Steptoe, and of course myself, leading the accounting charge. Once the data is in, what we do typically is we provide a lot of financial information. I apologize, I'm behind on my slides here. Uh, we provide information internally, so monthly to uh, managers, also quarterly reports to yourselves, council. And we do a lot of ad hoc reporting, so there is a need within the municipality as um, competing business priorities pop up to provide ad hoc reporting. For example, reserves is one that comes up often. We do report out to external bodies, uh, so we do provide financial statements, which is available for the public um, and is part of our legislative requirements. We provide reporting to the province and to the federal government. Monthly, we provide uh, information on our GST, for example. Part of the what is also our municipal assets. Being a municipality, we're incredibly diverse and complex. We hold thousands of assets, and our asset base is increasing every year. Currently, we hold approximately a half a billion dollars in assets, um, and our policy is that we track and report on everything that we acquire that's over $5,000. Um, it doesn't necessarily that mean that we're going out and buying an asset for $5,000. Um, it means sometimes that we are doing capital projects and when they're complete, we track that. Or sometimes when a developer has done a community, um, they're contributed to the town um, and we would add that to our register as well. It is worth noting that currently our assets are tracked manually. Um, this is a key data point um, and the rationale behind the asset management coordinator um, was to put in place a program or tool that was the central source of truth for the municipal assets. It is important that we keep track of the end of life of these assets 
when should we financially plan to refurbish or replace these assets, for example. You can tell what areas I'm passionate about. <laughs> Um, part, also, what we do is we provide reporting on grants and other sources of funding. By other sources of funding, I do mean franchise fees. We currently have two uh, utility providers that we collect franchise fees from, uh, and we collect those monthly. We also do uh, a lot of um, our revenue through grant funding. I thought it was useful to show this. Uh, the bars, the blue bar indicates 2020, uh, red is 2019, and green is 2018. Uh, so, and this is a percentage of grant revenue. Uh, over the past few years, we've trended to collect approximately $11 million in grant revenue, of which the lion's share is primarily from the province. Uh, it's important to note that these provincial funds are not from one grant, they're from anywhere between 10 to 15 different grants. And each grant has a unique set of requirements that we need to ensure that we're in compliance with to receive the funding. Also, in terms of deadlines for applications and reporting. So it's important that uh, we keep our lens on that. What we provide also, uh, we provide expertise on investments, cash management, and debt. Uh, of course, this all jumps off our 10-year financial strategy that's in our budget document. The finance team forecasts out our cash requirements, as you heard a little bit of that earlier with the debt bylaw. Typically, we manage about $5 million to fund our operational day-to-day -day needs um, and hold about, we've been trending $75 million in assets, or sorry, investments. <laughs> These investments are typically restricted and set aside uh, under various, for various reasons. So for example, for offsite levies, we have funds that are put away, and those are restricted for the sole purpose of what's um, written in the offsite levy bylaw. We also fund cash flow through debt, um, as you heard earlier tonight. Um, we aren't like a regular organization as a municipality. We must, we can only loan through the province, um, and that's dictated through the Municipal Government Act. Um, and of course, before we get to the part where we're loaning, we have to go through the bylaw process. The when and why. Um, again, our landscape is incredibly complex. There are many, many rules that dictate when we do uh, our financial reporting and why. Uh, the Municipal Government Act sets the stage. We also have, of course, our Canadian um, professional accounting body that dictates how we do our reporting. Um, we have other government bodies, as mentioned with grants, um, that um, give us guidance as for what, what their reporting needs are. We have internal guidelines, such as bylaws and administrative directives that we follow, as well as contracts and agreements. We also need to keep an eye on who we're reporting to, what do they need, do they need information about the core town of Cochrane, uh, services or do they need information about some of the uh, financial information that we have with our partnerships such as with Rocky View County or the library. Uh, of course one of the most fundamental documents that uh, financial services undergoes annually is our municipal budget. It sets the stage for our operational and capital projects throughout the year. Um, we, the financial services team, are leading management through this process um, and of course collaborating and presenting, debating um, and getting with senior leadership and council as well as getting public engagement and um, at the end of this uh, putting forward an approved budget document which sets the stage for the year. How do we do this work? We lean on our people. Uh, leaning on them to provide the financial expertise to do this work, uh, to create the policies which set the sound financial practices that we require. We're also stewards for, to ensure that uh, we're in compliance with these policies and procedures. We also lean heavily on our systems. Um, of course, uh, there are many systems and tools that finance uses to do the finance work. Uh, from our 
finance system to budgeting tools and softwares. We also leverage uh, payment tools such as Moneris. This graph just shows a little bit of how integrated all our systems and technology and software are. This top circle here is our core finance systems. We have our main system plus budget. Uh, we acquired in 2020 uh, Questica, which uh, put automated our budget process. Um, we also, on the left corner here, have several payment solutions, including Monero Square, and we also perform a lot of our payments online through our banking institution. I thought it was important to draw out here in the right-hand corner the other systems that do financial work. Uh, as it currently stands, these systems don't talk to our financial system, so the financial services team is busy reconciling, loading that information, and making sure that we've appropriately tracked and recorded that information. One picture I did sneak in was the entire financial services team. Here we are. <laughs> and this was this Halloween, so that's all I had. Thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation. I'm always amazed at how much goes on behind the scenes that we maybe mostly don't have any clue that happens, but it does, and thank you for that. And uh, I do appreciate the way you've delivered the message tonight. So I don't see any, no questions? <laughs> That'll be one question. Councillor Reed. Well, uh, so I will move the recommendation. Um, I did have just one question, but I nearly didn't want to go into it in terms of the, the, uh, the hour we're at. Um, how is Day Force working out for us? So, Day Force is the system that administrates our payroll, which is under HR. Um, as a user, I can say it's fantastic. It's so seamless from the user standpoint. Having a, having a little experience with Dayforce, we, uh, um, we're using both the accounting side and the HR and find that having the one common database actually saves a lot of time. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what we're migrating to? That's a part of where we desire to go to, getting more integration between our super systems like Dayforce and we have Great Plains Diamond um, and all the feeder systems. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't ask for a motion to go past 10, I'm getting the, uh, the ledge glare over there. It's, that's a term of endearment, by the way. So could I get a motion to go past 10, please, Councillor Nagel? <laughs> I move that we go past 10. Thank you. All those in favor? Reluctantly? Thank you. Okay, now we're legislatively on side. Thank you for the reminders. Um, where were we? That was your question? Well, I recommendation. recommendation and the question. Anyone else have questions of our finance department? Tanya's just walking away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, um, all those in favor of the presentation as presented? Thank you and thank you for coming tonight and waiting for us to get to this late hour. Thank you for your participation. And interest. Okay, that's, uh, well, that was finance, sort of. We're moving through finance. Notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion tonight? Councillor Fideko. Right. Um, Hold on. Can you, we just got to get your mic going there. There we go. A notice of motion that I'm seeking council's immediate vote on. With time being limited, I am seeking council support that the Cochrane Light Up Committee be given access to the grant funding of up to $15,000, which was already approved in the 2020 budget. Although the committee previously stated that Light Up would not occur this year, resulting in funding not being released, uh, or they just didn't need it, they have come forward to request funding be used towards a Light Up display on town land. This infrastructure can be used in future years, all while boosting spirits during these trying times. There will be no public gathering of residents so that we all stay safe and cognizant of COVID-2019 regulations. There will be no pre-announcements made as the committee is committed to making sure public safety is held to the highest regard. I hope that council will see the value in this request as Light Up is probably one of the biggest events that many residents are missing this year. 
So the formal uh, portion of this, thanks to Ms. Lowe for her help, um, that funding of up to $15,000 be approved for the Cochrane Light Up organizers to use towards a light display located on town land, town owned land in the historic downtown. Funds to be allocated from the 2020 Cochrane Light Up grant uh, were approved as part of the 2020 community grant budget. Um, because this needs to be decided on right away as time is pressing, I am looking at Council Waves' requirement for notice as established within the, within the Town of Cochrane procedural bylaw by the way of a two thirds majority vote. Okay, so I was just going to ask that very question two thirds. So, two thirds of us have to approve moving forward to have this looked at tonight. So, is that the first motion that we need? Okay, so that's what you've asked for is the yeah. two thirds? Okay. And it's based on, then we would discuss the motion. Request, okay. Yeah. Wow, got there on my own. Okay, so the motion on the floor is to have council give two thirds. What? We need two thirds of a majority vote to even be able to establish whether or not the funds. To take, talk to, about we, have to, we have to vote on that one, okay. but we just have to have two thirds to even go to that extent. Ms. Lowe. Respectfully, if you'd like to uh, know, the formal motion would be that council waives the requirement for notice as established within the Town of Cochrane procedural bylaw by way of the two thirds majority vote. Okay, so the motion is to waive two thirds. No, we need two thirds. We need a majority of two thirds. <laughs> okay, can you please repeat the, I, I, I'm messing it up over here. So the approval to debate immediately is that council waives the requirement for notice as established within the town of Cochrane procedural bylaw by way of a two thirds majority vote. So that would be the motion on the floor and that council would have to vote in favor um, with a five to five out of seven would be your two thirds majority. Okay, so everybody's clear. We're voting on waiving the requirement of notice and we need five to pass it. Okay. Call the question, all those in favor? Okay, carries. So we'll move on to your motion. Yeah, which is that funding of up to $15,000 be approved for the Cochrane Light Up organizers to use towards a light display located on town owned land in the historic downtown. Uh, funds to be allocated from the 2020 Cochrane Light Up grant were approved as part of the 2020 community grants budget. So this isn't a request of money from, you know, affecting this year's budget. It was already approved. They just never uh, used those funds that they were initially granted because they weren't going to put on light up obviously in the same way, but they have come up with a unique different idea. Um, and it is a, it is for capital expenses to be paid for it, uh, which the town could use for years to come. Um, I think it's also worthy to say that as somebody sitting on the economic recovery task force, um, and I know that Councillor Flowers is on the social task force. We have uh, one of the biggest things that came out of some of those, out of that joint meeting was just the need for some positivity. And I think positivity right now during the Christmas season is going to become bigger and uh, more important. So I'm hoping that we can allow them uh, to be able to brighten some spirits. And I did hold, hold on my own just a question about what, what events some people were missing. A light up was probably the number one event that people had mentioned that they were going to be missing out on this year. So obviously it's going to look different, but you know what it is, uh, it's going to keep us all safe, but hopefully bring us some joy and some lights. Okay. Councillor Nagel. I think I'm hundred percent on board with this motion. I have a question though. Um, is the intention that the money would be spent on some lighting and display stuff that could be reused again in the future? some Christmas spirit in December is much needed. So thanks for this motion and uh, you have my 100% uh, support. Thank you. Okay, who's next? <laughs> we got all these red lights on. Councilor McFadden. Uh, yeah, I certainly support this as well. Um, I Kudos to uh, the Light Up group for trying to like find a way and celebrate Christmas 
And uh, for our point of view, it's $15,000 we already approved in last year's budget. Um, the details of how they deliver that, I leave that to them and the town staff we have to work through. But as a concept, I'm all for it. Let's find a way to celebrate. Okay. Councillor Reed. Um, so d I'm just curious, what is the dollar amount again, just to be clear? Fifteen. Yeah, every year, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but they've been uh, offering grants up to fifteen thousand dollars per year. Fifteen thousand. Yeah, up to that. Purchase equipment. Yeah. And the equipment, who owns the equipment? Well, technically, the town does, since they're granting the opportunity. But Light Up will take care of it in the meantime. Yeah, I, I hate to kind of uh, be the Scrooge in terms of this discussion, but so what ha what uh, contribution have the Downtown Business Association done or the Chamber? Well, considering the fact that we're kind of a little late to the game, um, they do have a plan moving forward where businesses would have an opportunity, opportunity for sponsorship. Um, but because of discussions in the background, we didn't want necessarily one business or some businesses to benefit over others and so they looked at uh, only lighting up a town land so no it's not going to be on any businesses or not one business is, go is going to be able to benefit and then like I said they do have a plan moving forward that um, might enable more areas of Cochrane to take part in the light up celebration than just in the historic downtown which I think we all realize is a valuable thing. Yeah, I'm, again I hate to kind of sound like a Scrooge in terms of this, but it, it just seems rushed, uh, not well thought through, and I'm just uncomfortable with, with that, kind of, that kind of prospect. So if, that, if it's $15,000, it's purchase equipment, the town owns it, but who's going to maintain it and store it and all that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, they have, they have access to all that stuff. I mean, LightUp has been going on for years, and believe me, they've got more than enough equipment hanging around. Um, that they've had to look after so they have storage already covered so you have to keep in mind that they're not just coming out of nowhere asking for this this was money that's already been approved for them to host light up it just looks different this year fair enough okay that's helpful thanks councillor flowers i had some contact with the organizers as well and i know they did put a lot of thought into it over the last few months but things didn't turn out quite the way they'd hoped so the town land um, was sort of a last, the, or a decision made recently. So I am in favor of it because it's on town land and we'll be able to um, make sure that it's fair and um, everybody gets to see them. So I'm all in favor. Okay, it's looking like it's uh, going your way. I have one comment and that is, and as uh, Councillor Flowers, you kind of nailed it for me and you touched on it in your your motion that uh, while this was being worked on in the background there was a private business aspect and then public land thing so I'm glad that was um, rectified my question is and I think I know the answer but um, what are we to say to other groups who want to come forward for potential funding like this or other areas of town that would look for help in this time I do know that um, administration, I believe, is working on a grant policy, right, which will, I think, clarify some of the concerns that not only the Light Up Committee had, but other groups in town as to um, who is kind of grandfathered in as a large-scale event, what does that look like? I'm sure that we'll probably have more information as that information comes forward from administration that we have to vote on, but um, as somebody who has helped to organize Light Up, I can't tell you um, how many months go in to planning an event like this. Uh, Time-wise, uh, there, there's no money made. This is somebody who volunteers, the whole board volunteers their time, but it is an incredible, incredible amount of work. And obviously this year, we just couldn't host an event of 15,000 people in the downtown core. Um, so this is just gonna be a different way to celebrate. And you know what, they've put in a lot of thought, believe me, it took me all last week, I think, or a good portion of last week to kind of work with them to come up with a good kind of solution, I think, that will work. But it is something that Light Up is going to probably change in the future anyways. And uh, they've got a good plan moving forward, and I'm excited to have them launch that. So I think uh, I don't want to spoil their surprise because they've got lots of good stuff coming, but I would rather leave that up to the committee to, to bring forward. And then the last thing I have, and 
you touched on it too, but the, how will the group ensure COVID regulations or is it on um, user? It know? is It is why they didn't want to come forward with um, a solid public presentation because obviously we have media, we have press that are watching and they want to keep that very much on the down low. Um, the organizer of Light Up, Stephanie, uh, is a nurse. No, nobody knows the effects of COVID more than probably she does. So uh, she's she's really, really um, mindful of COVID regulations and making sure that we aren't risking any sort of public safety. So um, there will be nothing pre-announced. Uh, it'll be up to her to release that information, but there will be no forewarning as to what is happening. It'll happen in a live post of some kind, and then uh, it'll be well-regulated, though. We aren't, we aren't encouraging people to go downtown at all. Thank oh. you. Oh, on one night to celebrate. But I'll leave it at that. Okay. Councillor Reed. Yeah. There it goes. Um, if, if we approve this tonight, um, does this, are we committed in future years then in terms of an expenditure for this group? To go forward in the 2021 budget. Okay, but I'm, just in terms of the equipment, does that mean do, are we are we committed to something in the long term in terms of financially because of this equipment? No, this would this would purchase the equipment, so it becomes okay. ours. Okay, thank you. Councillor McFadden, no. Okay, any other questions? No. Wish to close debate? I can close debate. <laughs> okay, all those in favor of granting $15,000 to the light up to, uh, for their, whatever they're doing for light up this year. Okay, let's carry it. Thank you, Councillor Fideko. Any other notices of motion? <laughs> Councillor Wilson, I saw you move your finger. Okay. Uh, mayor's report. I'll keep it brief. Um, CMRB carrying on. Uh, I'm going to have a bit more of a mayor's report on that next time. Um, I did a quick interview with the Calgary Real Estate Board on our bridge. They were interested in doing an article on that for uh, Calgary Herald. That'll be coming up in a future edition. Uh, rec board, Councillor Reed, you can touch on if you wish. Uh, lots of resident meetings. I don't know, I think when we were in isolation, uh, they built up maybe, so I had quite a few of those this past couple of weeks. I was on the morning show at Cocker Now about our Facebook Live, and then the Facebook Live event. I thought, uh, I want to say thank you to all the group that uh, put all of the work behind the scenes to pull that off. It was. Uh, no small feat and something we had not done before on that kind of scale and I think uh, would really move the needle on um, our ability to reach the public and engage on a on an event or on a topic that uh, you know it's no secret that most people want to know about and what are we doing about it so uh, I was happy the way that came across and it sounds like that might be a, a format that we look to use in other areas as we you know with that elevated need for interaction. So uh, that is my report. That was under two minutes. Councillor McFadden. Well done. Uh, yeah, so actually my report has uh, two parts. Uh, I just wanted to give an update on the Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, the, much of the work that the uh, committee was assigned this year was around the master plans, the uh, Midford Park and the Ranch master plans, but those were put on hold due to the uh, COVID budget restructuring challenges. Um, so what a lot of the work that the group did do was engage with different um, user groups and champions that are looking to see their future on the landscape, whether that's um, uh, the different groups that are looking to see and expand on the ranch. Um, so just an example, at the last meeting, we had presentations from uh, Stockman's and Chaps about their vision for what they'd like to see on the ranch. Um, Mike Cochran and different reps have been reaching out and presenting about their vision and really pressing to be able to see what's going to happen on the Horse Creek uh, site for recreation and how they can advance that story. 
Um, so that's been a lot of the, the work with the group is just kind of um, getting in touch with those groups and understanding the stories that different recreation groups want to see. Um, so there really is pent-up demand out there for the Horse Creek Park to be developed. And uh, so my hope as we're looking into the budget and next year and the strategic plan is that we start looking at how we're able to give, develop a really good forward plan for recreation. I think it's been um, one of those things we've had to put to the side during this last year. But I just want to let uh, council know that there is kind of pent-up pressure from a lot of those user groups that want to see more parks, more recreation, and be able to access that. So um, that group is also, uh, six of those members are seeing their term expire. So that has been recruited for, and uh, so we had 20 applicants um, applying for that committee. So I'll be spending a good portion of this month doing interviews. Um, but it's great to have that much uh, public engagement and interest in contributing to our parks and recreation. So just an update on that, I, want, I wanted to highlight that as we head into budget that um, as much as we've been focusing on transportation and making it easy to get around, there is a lot of demand for how we recreate and enjoy our outdoor spaces. And then on another note, um, as many of you know, I've been involved with uh, Big Hill Haven and that's really opened my eyes to the importance of uh, domestic violence prevention and family violence prevention. And so one of the uh, items happening this month, um, and just as a highlight, um, Alberta actually has the third highest rate of self-reported spousal violence among Canadian provinces, yet family violence is preventable. And so uh, in Alberta, November is actually fi Family Violence Prevention Month, and it's been identified as a time to increase awareness of the resources and sports available so that we can work together to end family violence and build healthier relationships in our communities. So as part of my report, I'm asking that Council actually proclaim um, November to be Family Violence Prevention Month in Cochrane, and that as part of that, um, and to recognize the initiative, that November 25th would be declared Go Purple Day and encourage community support. Um, the declaration would be supported with municipal communication activities, including lighting of the bridge on November 25th. So uh, that's part of my request as my report is that um, we proclaim and recognize this with uh, Family Violence Prevention Month here in Cochrane. Okay, so we have a proclamation on the, on the floor. Is anybody opposed to uh, me proclaiming this month Family Violence Prevention Month? Seeing none, I will proclaim November the uh, Family Violence Prevention Month. Thank you, Councillor McFadden. Councillor Padeco. Um, just something quickly, uh, as a member of the FCSS Advisory Board, uh, we actually, uh, last Wednesday, we were able to dole out $120,000 to help support our uh, nonprofit organizations here in town, and that'll be obviously coming forward, I believe, in mid-December for council support uh, to see how we divided up those funds. But the process gets better and better each and every year, so kudos to the FCSS staff for for doing that and um, let's face it the, the need is plenty out there this year and moving forward so I just wanted to give them a big thank you for all their hard work all right thank you for that anyone else have a report I'm sure no okay there's only one thing left to do and that's adjourn this meetings terminated thank you